Hariyam. So today we're going to look at what's going on after she's delivered her baby and when we can start practicing. So we'll look first at the main changes that are going to be occurring for her after she's delivered her baby and what are the common problems. So if she's had a regular delivery, she's definitely going to have some discomfort in the genital area because we know that the pelvic floor has been stretched a lot to be able to birth that baby. So she might be having some tearing, she might have had stitches, but even if she hasn't, it's definitely going to be feeling quite tender, a little bit inflamed and a little bit stretched. So it is important to be aware of that when she is in sitting positions, when she's in the toilet, she can feel um, a little bit more uncomfortable. So thinking of sitting position, she will have to alter her sitting position accordingly so she feels more comfortable. And especially in the bathroom, when she has to pass uh, any urine or stools, she's possibly going to be feeling uh, a little bit uncomfortable at that time. And that's why it's often recommended that women have cold compresses uh, on the genital area, which can help to reduce swelling. Uh, even some women, they will get the sanitary napkins and they'll freeze them so that they then put them into their underwear and that will be a really cool, soothing effect. There's lots of other different uh, remedies that can be helpful for discomfort as well. Um, but what is most important is having cool water, keeping the area clean. So especially, uh, you know, when one goes to the toilet, um, using some water uh, is important. Uh, and especially you don't want it to be hot water, you want it to be nice cool water so it will have that nice soothing effect. Uh, in different cultures, different types of herbs have been used. Sometimes steam uh, is used um, or different, um, all sorts of different treatments can be there. But you do need to understand a little bit more about those types of herbs before you can recommend them. So yes, uh, the discomfort, the amount of discomfort is going to vary a lot to just having mild discomfort, which is there for one or two days, or it can be um, quite a bit more depending on how, how much she has torn or if she's had an episiotomy. So if you remember the episiotomy is where there's been a cut which is made to um, open up a little bit more to um, take the baby out and this is especially common if there's going to be an intervention like forceps or vacuum many times they may want to do an episiotomy uh, of course tearing can be there there's different stages of tearing so with first degree or second degree well first degree is just very mild second degree uh, may need a few stitches third degree is quite a bit more so that's tearing from uh, the vagina all the way to the anus and the fourth degree tear is through the anal sphincter as well so there's different levels of tearing third and fourth degree are not very common but they are much more common with interventions so things like um, the vacuum and the forceps, it's a much higher chance that there's going to be tearing because basically um, her body was not ready to give birth to the baby. So everything had not stretched sufficiently. So naturally there's going to be tearing if that happens. Uh, it's also quite common for there to be tearing if she has had a very fast labor and birth and her body again wasn't prepared. So that's where it's really important that uh, she goes as per her comfort. If it's going too fast, she does practices to slow it down. And um, she tries as much as possible to relax the pelvic floor. So yes, if the tearing or stitches is there, she'll be having those stitches, which um, will take uh, a few weeks before they've uh, healed. Uh, and of course, there are things that we can put on um, the stitches which can heal it faster as well. So as you see the next point, for some it will only be a few days and for others it may be many weeks. Uh, and 
That's where, you know, she does need to be careful. If she does have stitches, it's important that she uses water for cleaning. And also it can make it quite difficult for her to be going to the toilet. She can feel some discomfort there and it can make her even not want to go to the toilet. So that can lead to things like constipation as well because of the psychological effect that's there. Some women will have hemorrhoids. So that's generally from um, the pushing and the increased heat that can be there in that area. Uh, the lochia is going to be there. So bleeding will be there for up to six weeks. Generally, it's going to be um, heaviest for the first week or two, and then it will be fairly light. Uh, every woman is different. So here we say up to six weeks, but usually it's not going to be for that long. And I always found it funny that uh, a lot of women... They say to a pregnant woman, oh, yeah, you don't have to have your period. But actually, yes, she doesn't have a period for, for that whole duration. But then once she's had her baby, she's pretty much got all those periods put together. So the bleeding is definitely going to be there until all of that lining has been shed. Um, but definitely heavier at the beginning. And this is also a reason why we don't do practices like inversions. So because it's the time of, of that shedding and we want that blood to come out, we want everything to be complete. So before she can do things like a Vibrit Kani and Sarangasan, she needs to make sure that the bleeding is going to have stopped. So then there's possible frequent urination or incontinence. This is pretty common because of the stretching that has occurred in the pelvic floor, um, particularly at the beginning. If it continues... For a long period of time it really is important that she goes to see a um, physiotherapist and there are physiotherapists that specialize um, in incontinence uh, and the postnatal period so you can also call it physical therapist as different names so it's important that she gets that checked and also she starts doing her um, pelvic floor exercises early then the belly the abdomen is going to be soft flabby and still large so this is sometimes a surprise for a pregnant woman because she kind of feels that, okay, now the baby's gone, the belly should be gone, but the belly can still be there. And it can actually be something that she feels quite uh, embarrassed by because, yeah, sometimes uh, someone will say, oh, have you had your baby yet? And of course, she's already had her baby. So she can feel quite self-conscious um, about the belly being still large because it is going to take time for everything to kind of come back into its original shape. And it's going to be kind of weird because it's been hard for so long with the baby inside, very firm. And now it's soft, kind of gooey, you know. Uh, so it will take a little, a little bit of time for that. So that's absolutely um, normal and fine. And for some women, it's just a couple of weeks and their belly is already almost back to normal and for others it will be longer of course it will also depend on how much weight she put on during her pregnancy as to how fast uh, she loses that uh, and also how much activity she's doing postnatally then her body might be feeling quite tense so if you remember we were talking about labor being like a marathon but in a marathon you get to sleep after <laughs> whereas for a woman who's given birth yes she might be able to sleep for a couple of hours but she's certainly not going to be able to have a really nice long uninterrupted sleep so she can be feeling quite tense and tight um, from how the labor was and um, because she could have been in some really strange positions um, for her labor which she didn't really think about at the time because she was focusing um, you know on baby or she was focusing on contractions so she wasn't really thinking about on oh, my back or my knees or whatever it might be so the after effects of labor can be felt so uh, that can take quite a bit of time for her to recover from and then of course uh, this lack of sleep now I've said you know during labor you know, or a marathon, you don't get to have sleep afterwards. Now, many women are not sleeping well in that last month of pregnancy either because they're in that waiting game. There's lots of thoughts coming to their mind. And I've always felt that uh, it's like nature's way of preparing a woman for the time of 
a baby coming because if a woman is used to sleeping you know very deeply getting seven eight nine hours however much she normally sleeps and then she goes through labor and now she's got this baby and she's waking up every half an hour or one hour it's going to be even harder to cope whereas if she's been waking up frequently in the night in that month before though she might not be happy about it it's kind of like nature preparing her for what's going to be happening when she has her baby so yeah a lot of women don't sleep very well beforehand so that definitely takes adjusting and then of course in the postnatal period the sleep is is very less to how it was before um, some babies it depends also on when they're born some babies if they're really little they do seem to sleep quite a bit more uh, and but then of course they get to the point where they are waking more frequently as well so most women will find that they aren't getting very much sleep and you know you hear a lot like a woman um, feels like a zombie during the day or she wakes up in the morning and she's just like waiting for when she gets to go to bed again you know it can be really tough the lack of sleep and it takes quite a long time to be able to adapt to not having deep sleep because basically new mothers don't get deep sleep it's very very shallow sleep and they wake very very easily uh, and it will also depend on um, how she's raising her baby what kind of choices she's made with breastfeeding uh, bottle feeding if uh, her baby sleeps with her if her baby sleeps in a cot like all of this is going to be affecting uh, her sleep patterns as well so every woman is going to be different but definitely no woman gets enough sleep <laughs> so yes then the body can be tense from holding her baby because even though they're really little they get heavy especially when you're holding them all day and uh, some babies they don't want to be held sitting down they want you to hold them and they want you to move so that can also be quite draining and it can make the body feel very tight as well and then breastfeeding the baby so especially a new mother who's just starting to get used to the whole breastfeeding thing um, the types of positions she's in can make her feel quite uncomfortable so she really needs to experiment with her positions of breastfeeding and then see what really works for her and works for baby uh, laying on the side if she can feed her baby laying on the side is just amazing because it means that she can be resting much more than if she's in an upright position and especially if she's also um, sharing her bed at night then she can be feeding her baby on the side which is really helpful but every woman is different with what feels most comfortable for her and her baby but definitely the breastfeeding can make her body feel quite tense and tight then there can be hair loss so for a woman who is pregnant her hair is beautiful lovely luscious silky shiny and then she has her baby and basically she doesn't lose much hair uh, during pregnancy hardly any hair is lost but then when she's had her baby it falls out so it's like all that time <laughs> where it stayed in now it falls out so some women can actually be really concerned about the amount of hair loss they're having because it can sometimes come out in clumps um, there can be patches uh, where the hair has come out so that's another thing that can make some women feel self-conscious uh, it can also depend on how was her diet uh, during the pregnancy I'll tell you a quick story about my grandmother she uh, when she was pregnant with my dad there was not a lot of food uh, where she was raised um, and so you know she didn't eat very well and uh, she had her baby and when her baby was born she lost all her hair everything fell out because she was so malnourished so of course it's not going to happen that extreme these days but definitely some women do find that that hair is coming out uh, quite a lot and it can be very worrying but it doesn't stay like that it, it gets lost for a while and then it comes back to its normal state okay so then looking at the changes in the breast so 
First, the breast is going to be producing the colostrum. So we've talked about that sticky golden fluid, which is really, really important uh, for babies to have. If they have nothing else, at least they need to have the colostrum. But you really hope that they get to have the milk as well because it's so important. So the colostrum is there for the first couple of days and then the milk comes in. And when the milk comes in, she's going to generally have very, very full breasts. They're going to be much larger than they normally are for her. They're going to be like a full and hard and they can be quite hot as well. So especially the woman, if it's her first first baby, so first time breastfeeding, you know, her breasts have never had to deal with all this milk that's inside. It can be quite uncomfortable. Some women feel that just a little bit of pressure on their breasts and it can be hurting them. Just raising their arms above their head can be really difficult. You know, for some women, it's like having two basketballs. <laughs> so it is a important that she really does take care and it can take a while for her body to adjust to this um, changes with the milk supply and so what's most important is that she just keeps feeding her baby whenever her baby needs milk there shouldn't be any of this timed stuff like only every three hours or four hours or whatever it used to be it's really uh, well proven now that baby needs to have milk whenever it needs it because Baby's stomach is very, very tiny, like the size of a marble, and it empties really quick. So many babies will need to have milk very frequently, sometimes every hour or definitely every two hours. And because they're so small, it actually takes them a really long time to drink the milk as well. As they get bigger, they get better at having milk, so they get faster. But when they're really little, uh, it can be hard. And especially for some of the really tiny babies, or like the babies that are born early, preemie, um, they can kind of fall asleep sometimes when they're having milk. So it's not very efficient. So it can take really long. So many women, when they're feeding, it might take them up to an hour uh, just to feed their baby. And then, you know, there's just a little bit of time before that's digested. And again, they're, they're feeding. So a lot of women can feel like they're, actually breastfeeding all the time but um that's just the way it is and it's really really important for baby so yes she's gonna have that fullness she might have that hardness and that heat and her nipples are gonna be sensitive because they haven't had to deal with all this sucking which is there a lot <laughs> like I said babies have milk for a long um period of time in the day so all that stimulation to the nipples can make um, a problem especially if the baby doesn't have a very good latch so it's not latching onto the nipple very well if there's a, any kind of tongue tie there's different types of problems that can be there so if that latch isn't very good then there's going to be um, discomfort there on the nipple there can be um, cracking, there can be blisters, um, there can be bleeding. So all of this can happen to the nipples and it's pretty common for it to happen as well. Or just just for the body to adapt as well, it's very normal that it's going to be very sensitive and painful. Um, so it is really important that it's also checked how she is breastfeeding, that everything is going okay. And that's where postnatal care from a midwife or a doctor or a breastfeeding uh, consultant, lactation consultant is really, really important because if she's not breastfeeding well, uh, if baby can't have the milk properly, if the latch is wrong, then it's gonna create more discomfort for her, for her breast. It's gonna be a problem for baby and it's gonna be a problem on so many levels. Like they're gonna be stressed, there's not gonna be good sleep. Um, you know, mama can get very anxious. So support is really needed for breastfeeding. And it's really helpful if she has done some kind of breastfeeding course beforehand, because though we expect that, okay, it should be very natural and she, you know, she should know exactly what to do. Many women don't really know what to do. And breastfeeding in some countries is promoted really, really well. And in other countries, it's not. 
uh, and a lot of women do need support and that's one of the reasons why so many women don't feed their baby for very long um, because they just find it really uncomfortable and they don't have any kind of support and then they're just told okay just uh, go for a bottle instead it'll be easier but we know there's so many benefits to breastfeeding one's baby the World Health Organization recommends um, that a woman breastfeed her baby for at least two years. That's not very common these days. Uh, it's not even so common to feed the baby even up to a year. Many women will only feed for even three months, not even six months. Um, it's not recommended that a woman um, feed her baby other things apart from milk for the first six months. So breastfeeding is actually really, really important and has so many more benefits to feeding with a bottle. And of course, you have all the, the pranic benefits that are there as well, the connection. Um, so support is really, really necessary. And also to give education about the importance of breastfeeding um, should also be there. Even for some women, they, if they can't breastfeed their baby very well, it can also lead to things like postnatal depression. And I've known women, even when their babies are grown up, and if they had problems with breastfeeding, they still talk about it. They're still feeling these negative emotions. So as much as possible, we want to be able to support uh, women with their breastfeeding for as long as they want to be doing it. Okay, and that's enough about that for now. So we'll move on to low energy and tiredness. Of course, this is gonna be there because she's not getting much sleep. Um, she's had to deal with, you know, going through labor, which could have been really long. You know, some women may go through labor for, you know, up to three days or even more. So it's not. Now also many women will actually be on a really big high because of the endorphins. So, you know, they'll just be feeling amazing. They'll be feeling so excited. And especially if the birth was really, really positive, um, she can feel really, really empowered. Um, others, of course, may be feeling depression. Some mothers will be feeling like the baby blues, which is just for a few days, or some will go deeper into postnatal depression as well. Basically, there's going to be a lot of different emotions that are coming up. There's going to be, you know, positive ones. There's going to be negative ones. Um, depression can be there or baby blues can be there. If she's had trauma with her birth, if it wasn't how she was hoping it would be. As I said, if there's problems of breastfeeding, if she's um, finding other things really difficult with her baby. You know, there's lots of stuff that can be coming up which can make her feel down. So that's where, you know, yoga is such a support and teaching yoga in the pregnancy period is going to be so helpful for pre preventing postnatal depression. So the next point here can feel insecure about how their body is. So, you know, for example, you know, if she's, her belly's feeling really big, her hair's falling out, her skin's not looking the way it was before, you know, she's feeling really tired, she's looking tired. That's okay, because she's just grown this baby for all this time, and she's just given birth. So she should feel she should feel good about herself, but often she doesn't. It can also be the effect of society and expecting her to be acting and feeling in a certain way. So then if she's not feeling very um, happy and excited, she can feel guilty because she's got those negative emotions. So that's on one side, but then you see the other side, she can be completely amazed that her body managed to grow a baby, which is true. Many women will feel that it was just the most amazing experience of their life and some women will go between the two as well because as I said there's going to be um, lots of changes in the hormones and that's another benefit I'll say to breastfeeding there's, there's loads of benefits I'm going to give you a whole list of those but if she's breastfeeding then she's also going to be getting those happy hormones that are going to be helping her through this stage of ups and downs in new motherhood Let's look at how yoga can be beneficial. So 
Yes, yoga can tone the abdominal muscles and bring things back into shape. And yoga can also help bring the uterus back into its pre-pregnancy shape and position. And the other thing that brings the uterus back is breastfeeding. So when she is breastfeeding, her uterus contracts. And uh, many women will kind of complain a little bit about having cramping in their uterus, kind of like a menstrual pain as they're feeding their baby. And that's just because their uterus is contracting and getting back into shape. So actually it's okay if she's feeling that little bit of discomfort because it's just her body, you know, adapting and coming back to normal. But yes, that is one of the other benefits um, of feeding baby, that it does help with the postnatal recovery and to get the body back into its original shape. It's also um, important that if she is breastfeeding, it's going to help her, you know, if she wants to lose more weight, keep breastfeeding. <laughs> so yes, Prevention of postnatal depression, as we mentioned, balancing the emotions, improving overall well-being and fast recovery. And most important in all of that is not about the size of her uterus, is not about whether she's got a flat belly. It's all about her mental health and being supported. So that is what we want to look at first. And when we're going to be teaching yoga postnatally, we don't want to be focusing on, OK, let's just lose weight. Let's check in with how you are, how are you feeling, how are you sleeping, and giving the support. Motherhood. So it can be really tricky to find time for yoga because babies take up a lot of time. As I was saying about, you know, having to breastfeed a baby, breastfeeding takes a long time. Some babies take a long time to get to sleep. Some babies need a lot of additional efforts to help them get to sleep. So just looking after a newborn pretty much is a full-time job and not a full-time job, a 24-hour job. So it can be really hard to fit in any kind of time for yoga practice and that's where it's important to try to fit in yoga for small little parts throughout the day. And here I'm not just talking about asana because there are many other aspects that we can be thinking of. So yes, she can be feeling quite stressed because babies take up a lot of time and most women don't expect that a baby is going to take up that much time. Um, pretty much every woman I know before she became pregnant, she thought, okay, yeah, babies, they sleep and, you know, they, they lay around like gurgling and kicking their arms and legs and stuff like that. They didn't realize, myself included, how much time they take. So that can be stressful when you're used to having your own life and doing your own things and now pretty much everything is related to what's going on with the baby. And of course, some women uh, aren't having a lot of support either. And in different countries it's different, um, but a lot of women are alone in the daytime with their new baby. You know, their partner might be out at work. Um, they don't have any family nearby or their friends are all busy. So they're pretty much there with their baby. And, you know, for many women, they find it amazing and they love it. But for others, it can also be challenging. So many women can feel frustrated that they don't actually have any time for themselves. And that's why I often say in pregnancy that she should enjoy being with herself. She should enjoy any practice that she gets to have before baby comes, because once baby comes, it's really hard to fit anything in. So looking at the major life changes, now we've talked about the lack of sleep, and here, you know, I've put Yoga Nidra with a little smiley face, because of course, Yoga Nidra, um, a 30 minute Yoga Nidra is equivalent to half an hour's sleep. Sorry, not half an hour's sleep, three hours of sleep, which is amazing. So if she can do Yoga Nidra, it's definitely going to make her feel very good if she can fit that in. We've talked about not having any time, then life revolving around the baby, which is again, you know, a new thing for, for the mother. Then the changes that can be there in her social life. Now, before she had her baby, you know, she could go out when she wanted to go out. She could do lots of different things. And now, you know, she's got to think, 
is it okay for me to take my baby there? Do I want to get out of the house? Do I want to get in a car? Then I've got to put the, the baby into the car seat. I've got to bring, you know, these nappies. I've got to do this. I've got to feed the baby. You know, there's lots of different stuff that she can be thinking and worrying about. And uh, she might not feel comfortable to bring her baby out or to different places. So definitely her social life is going to take a little bit of a battering and it is going to be changing and that's where also friends might start to change because for example if she's a new mother and none of her friends have had a baby yet they may not be able to understand what she's going through and how much time this baby is taking of her and also how focused she is on baby she might not be interested in you know just going out and having dinner or going to see a movie or those kind of things that she might have liked beforehand so definitely the friends that she has can vary she might find that she starts to join you know pregnancy not pregnancy groups but mothers groups and uh, things like that you know so she'll start to associate more with other mothers because she feels a link between them and they can understand each other they can support each other so definitely the people around her will be changing and this can also create stress for her because if she's had friends that she's been around for a long time and now they're not interested in being with her or she's not really interested, it can make her feel guilty, it can make her feel, you know, worried. So lots of different emotions can be coming up. So yes, it is definitely a time of adjusting on all levels. And it's also a time to cultivate patience. And this isn't just for the new babies, this is pretty much for parenthood forever. Um, so cultivating patience, but especially with a baby and starting to understand what the baby needs about things like crying, you know. Um, some babies, they cry a lot. Some babies, they hardly cry. And there's no like good baby, bad baby. There's just babies and their different personalities and the different things that they're going through. So it's really important that we stay calm and relax and even if baby is crying we can still feel okay and do what we can to to help baby many mothers can feel very stressed if their baby is crying and they don't understand what their baby is needing um, and this in turn if the mother feels very stressed then the baby starts crying more so it's a vicious circle so there's a lot of kind of techniques we can use in yoga that can help that the first one is om chanting then Brahmri, then walking with the breath. So all of these can have a really nice way of calming down baby and also calming down mother. And sometimes a uh, mother just gets really stressed because, you know, baby's crying a lot and she can't really think clearly about what her baby needs. So it's important to kind of build that patience and also try to look from a different perspective so the perspective of baby, because, you know, think of baby was inside the womb, it was warm, it was, you know, soothing, um, the, the liquid was all around, the amniotic fluid was all around baby, um, baby didn't need to get any food because it was naturally coming, so there was never any thirst, there was never any hunger, all the sounds, though they were loud, they were muffled, so there wasn't any super strong sound there, then the light was very dull. It wasn't really bright. So, you know, the environment when baby comes out is really, really different. And it can definitely take quite a lot of adjusting, you know, to um, bright lights, to these strong sounds, to feeling hungry, um, even just to the sensation of air on baby's skin. So there's a lot of things there. And baby crying is pretty much baby's way of communicating. So a new mother needs to start to learn and learn her baby and understand her baby. And, you know, even if she's had already one baby and the next baby can be completely different. So, you know, there's never, you know, as they say, a manual to go with each baby. And there's no one manual that gives you all the answers because they're all different. So yeah, patience is necessary. We've talked already about crying, so using the technique of arm, Brahmri, Ujjayi for calming down the mother. 
And you'll see it many times when um, a baby's crying, if you start chanting on, then naturally the baby starts to relax, which is really lovely. And especially if she was doing om chanting when she was pregnant or primary, then baby's going to remember when she did that and the, the way that she felt. So she as in the mother, but also how baby felt with those vibrations. So looking now at breastfeeding. So while she's breastfeeding, she can chant on. If baby's having like a little bit of colic or, you know, irritable um, digestive system, then we can chant on. We can put our hands on baby's tummy and chant on as we breastfeed. Um, we can do meditation, relaxation. These things can be done once she feels comfortable in breastfeeding. So once she's got a nice position um, for herself uh, and she doesn't need to focus too much on, you know, making sure that the latch is good and positions right and all of that, then she can start doing these things. So it can take a little bit of getting used to before she's ready for these things, but definitely some meditation she can be doing, some relaxation, so kind of like a shavasana relaxing each body part. We can do that in a couple of minutes, uh, even sitting in a chair. So that kind of thing can be really nice. Then things like deep breathing and of course all the other breathing like ujjayi. She can also do the um, breathing out through her mouth, that slow feather breathing. She can um, do psychic analome velome, uh, which I taught in the postnatal uh, practical class. Um, she can do cooling breath. You know, there's loads of different pranayama or breathing techniques that she can be doing. And also this attitude of the witness. So taking a step back and just observing um, during that time of breastfeeding is also important. And being relaxed is actually really important when one's breastfeeding, because if she's feeling very tense, very stressed, then the milk is not going to be released, like the letdown reflex isn't going to happen. So she needs to make sure that she is as relaxed as possible. And then she feeds her baby. And especially if she is having some issues, if baby's not getting the milk very easily, or there's problems, then she needs to calm herself, center herself, be relaxed, and then feed. So continuing on early motherhood. So as I mentioned, she might not have a lot of time for us now. And that can make her feel sometimes frustrated because, you know, if she was used to doing like two hours of asana every day and now she finds it hard to do 10 minutes. Um, yeah, she can feel a little bit frustrated about it. But it's also a time where she has to look beyond asana and realize that actually there's so many practices that she can be doing. Um, there's so many practices as a mother that it is really a yoga practice in itself. So here you can see a few examples I've put of bhakti. Bhakti yoga, the devotion to baby, cultivating of patience, cultivating of flexibility, removing expectations. And that's where it kind of links in with karma yoga because our actions are selfless. It's not like, you know, we feed our baby and then we expect baby to say, you know, thank you or do something for us. There's no expectation there or well, there shouldn't be. <laughs> um, so that is a form of karma yoga. So once a woman realizes, uh, oh, okay, I am doing yoga, it's just in a different form, then she generally doesn't feel that frustration anymore. And eventually she can start to fit in different types of asanas in her own way of doing things. So let's look at the important points to remember. So this is when she's going to start doing yoga practice more. So here I'm talking specifically about movements and asanas. So what she can do is all dependent on how is the birth. So if she had a normal birth, if she had interventions, like if she needed to have um, a cesarean, if she needed to have forceps delivery or vacuum delivery, all of this is going to be affecting her. Did she have to have an episiotomy? Um, you know, what, was there tearing? Were there stitches? So all of that will affect what kind of practices she can be doing and when she can start certain practices. Um, it is important that she also checks with her doctor or her midwife. Now, ideally, she should uh, have this check at six weeks 
and in many countries a midwife will be checking on her very frequently. Um, some women will stay in a hospital or a birth center for a few days or even up to a week in some cases, but many women will also go home very early on, sometimes the same day. And of course, some women will give birth at home too. But it is important that a midwife is checking up on her. Um, so checking up not just on, you know, if she's had stitches to check on stitches and things, but also checking on if she's had any, split, if the split abdominal muscles are there, if they're starting to heal, checking also uh, if she's had a cesarean, like how is the healing um, of the wound? And also, how is her mental health? You know, is she sleeping? Is she feeding baby okay? Does she have any um, problems that are going on? So this is really where it's important that she does see uh, a nurse or a midwife or her doctor. And generally, uh, at the six-week checkup, after that six-week checkup, that's generally where she may start coming to a class or start asking you about practices to do. It's not very common that a woman will want to be doing different types of yoga before six weeks because there's so much going on for her already. So avoiding any strong opening practices until she feels completely comfortable. So imagine if one's had tearing in the perineum, she's not gonna wanna be sitting in a cross-legged position until that's healed which might be a couple of days, might be a couple of weeks. Um, so basically all that pelvic opening is going to be avoided. So any pelvic opening when she starts is going to be really, really gentle. And of course she needs to follow the principles of comfort, steadiness and awareness. Um, that's always going to be there through pregnancy and the postnatal time. And she shouldn't have expectations of what kind of practices she needs to be doing because Every woman is going to be different. Every birth, you know, is different. The healing is going to be different for each woman. Her situation is different. But there should never be any pain or discomfort when she's practicing. So what kind of things to do and when to start? So from the time of birth, if she had a regular birth, she can start gentle yoga practices right at the beginning. So things like ankle movement, shoulder movements, hand movements, arm movements, this can be done. Uh, then she can start Udhyan Bandha, so a gentle version of Udhyan Bandha in Shavasan, which is there in the postnatal video, and Mula Bandha, she can also start. So these kind of practices she can do, um, even some of these simple movements can be done after she's had her caesarean. Of course, we don't do Udhyan Bandha um, at that time. Basically, when the caesarean is there, you don't want to be doing anything that's going to be affecting the belly. And even simple practices can be affecting. You think of, um, you know, a woman who's had a caesarean, she's not allowed to drive because that pressure of her foot on the accelerator or the brake or the clutch is going to be affecting her abdominal muscles. So she has to stick with really, really simple practices because yes, she's had abdominal surgery and it's gone through many layers and there's a lot of stitches inside. And yes, the outer wound, it heals quite fast, but the internal stitches take much longer and we don't want those to be breaking. We don't want any kind of infection to be there. And I've known women who have had infections from the cesarean, they've had to be opened up, cleaned, stitched up again, and it's quite horrific, especially when you're dealing with a new baby, and then you have to go through more abdominal surgery. So really only simple practices and nothing that's going to be affecting the belly in any way. So gentle yoga poses, we can start from six weeks after birth if there were no kind of complications. Um, and three months later, a regular yoga routine can be practiced. So all your classic asanas from three months. If she had a normal, if she had a cesarean, then she needs to wait for at least eight weeks or until the wound has healed. And then normal yoga routine after six months. So basically, uh, she can be starting 
between eight to 12 weeks, you can start doing some different types of movements, some um, very, very simple types of asanas. And then she can slowly build up over a period of time. So particularly the asanas that are going to be stronger on her belly. So things like Paschimottanasana, Dhanurasana, the bow pose, Ardha Matsundrasana, the half spinal twist, um, Bhujangasana, the cobra pose. So those ones are stronger on the belly. So those ones she wants to wait until she's around about six months just because they're much stronger. So sticking with really, really simple uh, asanas from at least eight weeks, ideally around 12 weeks, and then slowly, slowly building up over a period of time. Then if there's any tearing or stitches, of course, what kind of practices she does will depend on how quickly the healing is there and how, how strong the tearing is, like what degree. Uh, and as I've already mentioned, it can be difficult to sit. And so if it's difficult to sit, there's a lot of yoga practices that she won't be happy to do. Because of course we want everything to be comfortable. And as I've already mentioned, we're avoiding those pelvic opening practices. So what do we wanna focus on? Well, we wanna strengthen the pelvic floor. We wanna strengthen the abdominal muscles and the lower back and tone the uterus. And luckily a lot of practices are doing kind of all of those at the same time. We also wanna close the pelvic floor because we've been doing all this pelvic opening for you know the whole duration of the pregnancy. So now we wanna close it. Then we wanna stretch the shoulders, the upper back and the neck. So we wanna open the chest. So all of this is necessary to help with all the breastfeeding which where she may be hunching over quite a bit, improving her posture and relieving any tension. And, you know, even if she's not breastfeeding, even if she's bottle feeding, or even just, even if she's breastfeeding in really uh, good ways with good posture, she's still going to be holding her baby a lot, which is going to be creating that tension in her body. Uh, so it's important there and that's where it's also important that if she is using any kind of slings or wraps that they should really suit her body and they shouldn't be putting additional tension on any part of her body that's going to, you know, create any problems. And then balancing and calming the emotions because definitely there's going to be a few highs and a few lows. Uh, so recharging, recharging her body and her mind, giving her energy. And there's a lot of different practices that can help with that. So, of course, all the different pranayams, especially analom vilom, the alternate nostril breathing, is going to help with balancing of the emotions. But then uh, all the relaxing ones are going to be important too. So the cooling breath, the ujjayi, the brahmari, um, just simple deep breathing is all really, really important. And then yoga nidra is going to be really helpful too. So yoga nidra, uh, a postnatal yoga nidra especially, will be really needed. And mantra chanting, of course, so she can be chanting just om, or she might chant Mahamutunje, which is for healing. She might want to chant some Gayatri, um, especially if she's feeling really tired. And of course, nice gentle stretches are going to make her feel really good as well. You know, just simple things like when you wake up in the morning and you stretch your arms up and down, stretch out your body, that kind of thing. If she's doing it throughout the day, that's going to make her feel good. So let's look at some yoga practices, specific yoga practices. So these are ones that we can start from the first after the first few days and for the first six weeks. And of course, continuing on after that. So here I've written if there was no cesarean, because a lot of practices are going to be affecting the abdomen. Of course, she can do like shoulder movements, neck movements, hand movements. They're going to be fine. But then as soon as you move into like hip movements, that's going to be affecting. A lot of the knee movements are also affecting. The ankle movements she, she should be able to do okay. But just remembering that everything is connected. So it's really important that she gives herself time to rest and looks at instead of 
asanas, she looks to all the other practices that would be helpful for her. So continuing on the types of asanas, so starting with the simple ones, so things like Tadasana, the palm tree pose, it's going to be really nice uh, to relieve any tension in her back. Tirak Tadasan, the swaying palm tree, so again, same kind of thing. Kati Chakrasan, the waist rotating pose, so again, really good for her spine um, and relieving kind of tension up into the shoulders and the chest. Um, Madhurasan, the cat pose, so again, really good for the back and it's going to be starting to strengthen um, her abdominal muscles as well. Shashankasan is going to be a really soothing, relaxing asan for her to do. So it's going to have that gentle pressure being put onto her belly. Um, but it's a nice kind of pressure. It shouldn't be obviously painful, um, but it is very soothing and it does give her that little bit of time to go inwards. Uh, so that's also known as the child's pose. Gomukasan, the calf face pose. So that can be nice to give a little bit of a different stretch into the hips. So instead of having that pelvic opening uh, and of course the arm options in Gomukasan. So things like Badahasta Gomukasan where we are tying our hands behind. So they're options which are helpful for the upper back and the shoulders and the chest. Then we have Sahaja Hasta Bhujangasana, the easy cobra position. So this is just a really nice one for the spine. Arkana Dhanurasana, the stretched bow pose. So that's really nice for opening up the chest and, and the upper back. Raju Kashanasana, the pulling of the rope. So again, good for the chest and the shoulders and upper back. Sankatasana, Sankatasana, the difficult pose. So that's good for all the joints, basically. And of course, it's a balancing asana as well. So it's good for strengthening the nervous system and it's going to give her a little bit of calmness and peace. Vrukshasana tree pose. Again, nervous system, balancing position. So really good for concentration and focus and calmness. Then we have Sula Pawan Muktasan, so the easy gas release pose. So that's the one where the head stays on the ground. So it's just a really gentle version of pressing the thighs towards um, your belly. And here we are, we've got some pictures. So here you can see how we can implement baby, because as I've mentioned, it's important that we know how to practice when we've got baby around, because pretty much baby's there <laughs> um, and to feel connected. So here you can see things like child's pose with baby is there so you can hold baby's hands or holding baby's feet. Um, so baby also feels really comfortable because baby's still got your touch. Then we can do you know things like side stretches while baby's sitting in your lap. Of course anything where you're holding baby you want to make sure that baby's not going to get dropped, roll off your lap, hurt hurt themselves. So you need to be supportive. Uh, and of course, some babies are more comfortable in certain positions than others. Some fidget a lot. So you have to go as per the baby. So you can see some twisting position. We've got Gomukas in there. Um, so all those can be nice to do. Then we have things like the Easy Cobra. So just uh, playing with baby. We can do things like the cat pose where we're ra and the variations where we're raising one arm and one leg and we're just still connecting with baby. Uh, we can do shavasan with baby on our chest and we can have our baby, you know, uh, with their back against our body or, or they can be in prone position, depends on the baby and their comfort. Um, so those can be nice nice practices to do. We can do some different types of twists. So those leg movements, the knee movements can be done if baby feels comfortable. Yeah, you can see the cat pose that we can be doing. And, you know, as baby's getting larger, we can start doing things like peekaboo. But to begin with, just uh, gazing at baby and starting to do some different movements. And here you see a little picture of issue two because yeah, if, if it's a second child or third child or whatever, it's also important that they feel really connected to, the, to their sibling. So they can do yoga too. And here you can see 
some different types of movements that we can do on the ball. So using a yoga ball or whatever you like to call it, um, we can be sitting on that. And uh, a lot of women will have one of these balls because they use it in pregnancy. It's so beneficial for a pregnancy. And it's also really helpful if you have a baby that likes to be bounced or moved because we can sit on the ball, we can do different types of movements and just sitting on the ball is going to start strengthening uh, our pelvic floor and our core muscles. So it might be that she just sits on the ball and for, for five, ten minutes every couple of hours and she'll start to get those benefits. So there's lots of different movements of the joints that we can be doing here. You can see me doing like an ankle rotation. Um, we've got some shoulder movements, we've got some twists. And of course here I've got baby in a wrap, so baby's much more supported. And it also means that I've got my hands free. Of course, it might be that you need to do a little bit of bouncing occasionally, um, but that's fine to do. Some, you also want to make sure that you're using the right kind of wrap or sling because some slings particularly can be really low. Uh, so baby also doesn't feel very comfortable because baby generally wants to be close to your chest, not down somewhere near your belly. So you also want to take care with the type of sling. And if you are having a sling that goes over only one shoulder, then sometimes there can be a little bit of an imbalance. So often the wraps are a good option because they're a little bit more supportive, both for baby and also for the mother. More so we can do without the ball. So we've got Raju Kashanasan, the pulling of the rope. Um, we've just got like meditation that we can do or pranayam. And we've got balancing. So we've got Sankatasan. Of course, you're not going to go and do some crazy balancing poses while baby's there uh, in the wrap because you don't want there to be any chance that you can fall over because you've got this precious little baby you don't want to do damage to. So, of course, if you're going to do a balancing position that uh, doesn't feel that comfortable, like uh, that you don't feel very stable in or your student doesn't feel stable in, then using a chair or using a wall as a support is really, really important. You don't want to be doing crazy things. So continuing with those first few days and continuing for those first six weeks. So here I've included uh, cesarean for some of them. So that all the breathing practices, as I've mentioned, the deep breathing, ujjayi, brahmi, and lomvalom, all of those definitely she can do. She can get so much benefit. Chanting of Om especially and Mahamutunje, Mahamutunje for healing, yoga nidra, Definitely Mula Bandha, as we've mentioned, and Ujian Bandha, the laying down one. Of course, that one is not for the cesarean. So looking at after six weeks, so if, if everything's going okay, if she's healing really well, then she can start doing some other types of practices. So here, uh, I've not recommended them for cesarean. For some of the Practices she'll be able to start with uh, if she's had a cesarean, but lots of them she'll have to wait a little bit longer. So Udiyan Banda and Agnisa, she can begin for natural birth. And when she does these, she can start them slowly and really, really gently. Okay, so she's not going to go and do like, you know, a hundred repetitions of Agnisa. She's just going to start with a really small amount and build up over time. And same with Udyan Banda. She's not going to be pulling in for um, really tightly and holding it for, you know, 30 seconds or, or longer than that. She may do Udyan Banda just for five seconds, 10 seconds. So these practices are done from standing. Then looking at Vyagrasan, the tiger pose. So she can be doing that. So if she has had a cesarean, so here I've written not cesarean if it's six weeks, but if she's up to three months uh, after her cesarean, then she can start some of these practices. Udyan Banda and Agnisa, she can't, but other things like the tiger pose, she can. And I've put a video uh, of, of this as well, so you'll get a better idea. We've got some leg movements and knee movements, so things like cycling, the leg rotations. So all these can be done, but again, it's really important that they're started gently. So, for example, if she's doing a leg rotation, she might just do one 
rotation, then rest, then go the other way, then rest. She shouldn't start saying, okay, now I'm going to do 10 repetitions this way, 10 the other way, you know, then do with double legs and then do this. You know, it should be all very slow and carefully. And all those kind of leg and knee movements are really good for strengthening the core. But also, if you do a lot of them, they're also going to be stressful on the back. So if she's got back pain, she needs to take extra precautions there. Then we have things like the plank position. So she can start with her knees on the ground and then she can start lifting up one leg, then lifting up the second, uh, and then she can start holding it. So it's, you know, starting just with a few seconds and then she can build up over a period of time. Then we've got downward dog. So that's like a nice gentle inversion uh, and it's going to give a nice stretch into her back and into her hamstrings and her calf muscles. Then the right angle pose. So that's a nice one that she can do. Um, pretty much she can be doing that from the beginning uh, for a regular birth. And that's going to give a nice stretch into her back and her chest. And then we've got Ardha Matsendras and the half spinal twist. So she can start with the simple uh, variations to begin with. And then over a period of time, she can start getting more towards the classic asana. We've got Uttan Padasana, the raised leg pose. So she can start with one leg and then build up to two legs. And there's different ways that we can come into that, which you'll see in the practical class. We've got the wall squat, which she can be uh, doing to strengthen her core. And then we can start implementing different types of back bends. So things like the half locust pose. When she's used to that, she can move on to the full locust. Um, she can have the sphinx position, so she's already doing the easy cobra, then she can move to the sphinx, then she can move to Saro Hasta Bujangasan, the straight arm cobra. Of course, starting with the elbows bent and then, you know, going into the full one. So over a period of time, she's moving towards more of those classic asanas. But it's really important to do everything really gently. Uh, and then we have Viparit Kani, the inverted pose, and Sarangasana, the shoulder stand. So uh, those are nice inversions, which can be helpful if there's been any kind of uh, uterus prolapse. Uh, but of course, it's necessary that the bleeding has to have finished, which is why we say at, at least six weeks before she does those practices. And also for some women, it will be hard for them to come into the position. So that's where if she uses the support of the wall, then she'll find it easier to come into the pose and also to come out of it because it does involve quite a bit of core to be able to lift up the pelvis uh, to go into things like Viparit Kani. So that's something that she can build up with over. And here we've just got some pictures of um, uh, how you can incorporate baby. So Pawan Muktasan, the gas release pose. So when baby's smaller, we can have baby on our chest. Now you've got a picture of Ishi, she's a bit bigger there. Um, but, you know, you can use a small baby. Uh, and then later you can have the baby on your shins in Pawan Muktasan. Of course, if they're going to be on the shins, then baby needs to be able to hold uh, its head very well. We've got Pashimottanasan, the full forward bend, and we've got Ardha Pashimottanasan, the half forward bend. So she can start to do these very gently and she can have her baby, you know, if she's doing the full Pashimottanasan, she can have baby on her shins and then she can be leaning forward towards baby. And same with the half version, instead of having baby on her shin, she can just have baby next to her leg. So she's still, you know, talking and um, doing things with baby, but she's also getting a stretch. And uh, it's nice to do those kind of ones later on as well, when baby starts to sit up and starting to play a little bit more. And you can start to do those things without baby noticing. Because sometimes when babies realize you're doing something that's, not involving them, then they get cranky. <laughs> so yeah, there can be some sneaky ones to do. So Haja Hasta Bujangasan, of course, we've already talked on involving baby. Ida Chakrasan, the half wheel pose. So you can see that down on the bottom there. So once baby can hold um, his or her head, then we can have baby on our pelvis and then lifting baby up and down, which they absolutely love. 
Then we've got the locus pose. So while we're doing that, we can just be uh, paying attention to baby two. We've got Virasan, the warrior pose. So you can see the picture there of um, Ishi on my leg. Um, most babies to begin with, they want to be facing you, but some babies like to be facing out. So you can experiment. And then we've got Anantasan, the Lord Vishnu pose. So we've done six of them in pregnancy and we can be doing those again postnatally. And especially if we're laying on our side, we can have baby laying next to us and it's nice to be able to incorporate those kind of. Then we have our cross leg twists or our Vajrasan twists. We've got Uttanpadasan, the raised leg pose, so we can have baby on our chest while we raise our legs up. We can do things like Tadasan, the palm tree. Of course, it has to be slightly different because we're, we've got uh, one arm where we're holding baby, or of course, if we've got baby in a sling, then uh, we can do the regular one. But otherwise, we have to kind of adapt. Then Tirak Tadasan, the swaying palm tree pose, and Kati Chakrasan, the waist rotating pose. So they're all different positions that we can be involving baby. So just as a review of the guidelines and practices, now we've talked quite a bit about these things, but just to remember, resting whenever you can and only doing things that feel very comfortable. Uh, and actually these practices are what I give to my students who are postnatal or also for women who are pregnant and are about to deliver their baby and you know, you never know exactly when it's going to be. So you might give them a handout of things that they can they can be doing um, when their baby's born because it might be quite a while before they join you for a class again. But they do want to know what, what will be helpful for them. So yeah, always listening to the body. When you have time, do yoga nidra, deep breathing, ujjayi, brahmi or om. Take shavasan whenever it's needed. And shavasan can be a real recharge. Like if she's feeling... Uh, a little bit tired um, during the day, if she just lays down and does a five minute shavasan, it can make her feel amazing. So it's definitely a really helpful technique um, for her to be using any time in the day. And then of course, uh, Mula Bandha she can be doing and the gentle Udiyan Bandha, this, this sim very simple one she can do. And then looking at motherhood, so the first year, so yes, you see the most challenging experience, but the most rewarding. Definitely it is challenging for pretty much every woman, if she's honest with herself, there are lots of things that are gonna be challenging her. Um, so, you know, the challenges are there, but there's always amazing experiences as well. So though she can find it challenging, you know, she would never, want to go back to the time before her baby was born. So it is definitely an amazing year, that first year. Um, she gets so many um, joys out of her baby in that first year. But yes, definitely it is challenging. And that's also where women need to speak up more and they're starting to speak up because previously it was expected that, oh yeah, you've got a new baby, you should be so happy and you should feel this and you should feel that. And of course, women can feel overloaded, they can feel challenged, and that's why it's really important that women do have support. So, you know, mother's groups are really helpful, but a postnatal yoga group is also really, really helpful. A mum's and baby's uh, class is so helpful to give support for new mothers, to, to meet other women, to realize they're going through the same kind of things, to realize that their baby is absolutely normal. And yes, it's normal to wake up, you know, 10 million times in the night. It's normal to want milk all the time. It's, you know, it's normal for them to whinge about all sorts of things. It just makes her feel that, okay, I am doing a good job and there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with my baby. And uh, I'm, yeah, normal. So support is really, really important. Uh, so next, adapting how we feed baby to incorporate yoga. <laughs> so yes, we can feed baby and do some yoga at the same time, as we've mentioned, practicing yoga with baby, as we've talked about, uh, and then increasing energy. So the practices of Kapal, Bhati, Agni, Sanu, Udiyan, Bandha, as well as, of course, Shavasana, as I just mentioned, are all going to be increasing the energy levels. 
Then uh, if she is wanting to start losing some weight, then those practices, Kapabhati, Agni, Sal, Udyan, Banda, of course, are going to be all really helpful. She can add in Bastraka to that. She can do Surya Namaskar. And all the classic asanas are going to be helpful too. But as I've mentioned before, weight loss is not the priority at the beginning. But then she can start working on that later. And of course, breastfeeding a baby is going to help with that too. Yoga Nidra we've talked on for sleep. And the last point I want to talk about here is purpose. So some women can feel that they're just a mother now. And there's, it's never just a mother, but for some women, they can feel that they don't have the other things that they had in their life before. Uh, so, for example, you know, if she was working before and now she's not and she's at home and she's with baby all day, then sometimes she can feel that she needs something else in her life. So meditation can be helpful. Uh, the swan practice can also be helpful for her to get an idea on her purpose. And um, if she needs to change anything in her situation at the time, maybe she needs to get out a little bit more. Maybe she needs to be social. Maybe she needs to start working a little bit. Maybe she needs to start volunteering. Whatever it is that she feels that she needs. Some women are very, very happy to be a like, full-time um, stay-at-home mother very happy they love it and other women they struggle um, there's nothing that is right as such because every woman is different but it is important that um, each woman feels satisfied in what she's doing so that's just a little bit about the first